Uh, as we're going into Habakkuk 2, we've talked a little bit about this, that it's the struggle to wait. It's the struggle for us to wait on the Lord to see what's actually going to happen. And I heard another pastor tell this story one time about this preacher. And this preacher pastor is kind of thinking through things and really searching the word. And he's trying to find answers. And he's desperately calling out to God, like, give me answers, Lord. I want to know why this is this. And I want to know why that's that. And Lord, why is your timing uh, not what I think it should be? And as he's crying out to God, an angel appears to this guy. And uh, clearly this is a made up story. Uh, and so an angel appears to this guy and the angel's standing there before him. And it, uh, the pastor says, wow, this is amazing. Thank you. Thank you for coming to me and hearing my cry. I've just been searching the scriptures and I have so many questions and begins to ask the angel questions. And in the midst of those questions, he says, you know, you know, God is, God is, God is so infinite and outside of time and he's amazing. What, what's like, what's a million years like to God? And the angel says, about a second. And then he's like, oh man, you know, he's, he's, he owns a, a thousand sheep on the hills. He owns everything. His riches are insurmountable. So what would like a billion dollars be like to God? The angel says, about a penny. And he's like, that is incredible. Could you do me a favor? Could you go back to God? And could you ask him for me if he would give me one of his pennies? The angel just kind of smirks and says, sure. And heads off back to heaven and comes back a few hours later. And the, the preacher's like, oh, thank you for coming back. What did he say? And he goes, well, he said, yeah, you can have a penny. He goes, when? About a second. <laughs> Some of you get that later. The first part of the joke played into the last part. And while that's kind of a humorous thing to think about, we do struggle with waiting. And while we consider every day to be a long stretch at times when we're going through things, God is not slow, He is not missing, He is not absent, uh, He is there, He is present. And so we're going to read Habakkuk 2, and we're going to do a little bit of a preview, or a little bit of a review of, of 1, and then really land in 2 here. So starting in verse 1, I will take my stand at the watch post and sta station myself on the tower, and look out and see what he will say to me, and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long and loads himself with pledges? Will not your debtors suddenly arise? Those who awake, who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoil for them. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the peoples shall plunder you. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have fortified your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of his glory of the Lord and the waters as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze on their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself as you and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come against you, and utter shame will come upon your glory. 
The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them. For the blood of man and the violence of the earth to cities and all who dwell in them. What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies. For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent, uh, keep silence before him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning, God. We thank you so much for your word. Um, as we read through this and as we ponder what you have uh, to tell us this morning, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would make the plain things the plain things, the main things the main things, and that we would grab on to what it is that can grow us, sanctify us, encourage us, challenge us. And if we don't know you here this morning, Lord, I pray, move us uh, towards a saving understanding of who you are. And Lord, we uh, trust in your word. We trust you. We know, Spirit, that you are here and you are active and you are moving. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So, believe it or not, by the end, you might think opposite of what I'm about to tell you. But had I put everything in that I could possibly put in for Habakkuk 2 into one sermon, uh, we would need some tents and some sleeping bags and everything else. There's a lot. Like, my notes are notes upon notes upon notes upon notes. And so I try to condense it into about an hour and a half of a sermon. I'm just kidding. I try to condense it down, though, and hopefully... Um, you know, obviously I, I pray that God whittled out the things that didn't need to be said and will focus us on the things that do, um, again, for his glory alone. But the first thing we're going to talk about, and I mentioned this last time, is the problem of evil. The problem of evil is one of those things that has been around for a really long time. This is a question that has been around longer than it's even given credit for being around. Epicurus is the person who's given credit for coming up with the problem of evil, but it was around way before him. I mean, look at how many people in the Old Testament ask God, why, when, how, where, we don't get it, we don't understand, we don't see where it's coming from. How can these things keep happening that are bad when I know that you are God and you are good? Now, they asked it in a different way. The ones who are the believers, the ones who are following God, who asked this question said, I know you're good. I'm just trying to figure out how there's this. While the world with the problem of evil is, there's bad things, so there can't be God. Like there's some sort of uh, only one way it could possibly be. But this is a philosophical question for anyone who has experienced pain. And last time I checked the tally list, it's all of us. Every person has felt pain, sorrow, weakness, heartache, any number of things. All of us fall into that same boat, and all of us have to come to an understanding of who God is. Maybe before you were saved, you really wrestled with this problem. Maybe as you are saved, as you've been a believer, this question has come at you more than once. Maybe this is the first time you've ever had to wrestle with it. Uh, if you truly step out and try to live your faith out or try to share your faith, this is the favorite thing to be thrown back at you by the world. I can't believe it because bad things happen. So how do we reconcile evil and the existence of God as we know God from the biblical understanding of who God is? It was uh, funny the very first time that I got in a conversation with someone about this a long time ago. They kind of posed the question and they kind of laid it out there. There can't be a good God if there's evil in the world. Like it was a mic drop. And I was pretty young. Like I did not really uh, have a great base for my answer. And so for me, it was not a mic drop. It was Oh, I'm going to get them. I'm going to come up with something. The thing is, is that I wasn't able to come up with anything new, flashy, or anything under the sun other than what God has already said himself. The problem is they have more to work through, actually, if you think about it, than we do when we think about the problem of evil. If there's evil in the world and there's a good God, can those things exist? Here's the thing. If you believe there's evil in the world, you have to also believe there's good in the world. So where does that good come from? You can't call something evil if there's no good to balance out the other side. Otherwise, it's basically just a neutral that they all are living out at the same time. So to have evil, we must know good. Otherwise, evil isn't evil. And the unbeliever must reconcile, why is there good in the world? So as I've engaged more people who ask this question, how can there be evil if there's a God? I ask the question, how can you believe there's evil if there's good? I mean, how can you believe there's evil if there's no true good? 
And if there's true good, that true good has to come from something outside of ourselves because if you know man well, it's not inside of our bent to be good necessarily. Yeah, we'll do good things, but we choose selfishness and sin normally. So if there's no good moral law giver, and again, God's bigger and more important than that, but if there's no ultimate good law moral giver, then there's no standard of good. If there's no good law, perfect, moral law giver, perfect, then there's no standard of good because then good becomes relative to everything. So if everything is relative, then this is a really long loop back. Hopefully you're following me here. So as I have these conversations, I'm like, okay, so if good is relative, then well, good, because the answer I get back a lot of times is, well, good is what I deem to be good. Excellent. Then Hitler was good. No, Hitler's one of the worst people ever. Hitler fully believed that the Third Reich was going to be the best thing ever and actually used God, even though his vision of who God was going to be or is, was obviously way off. But he thought that was the right thing to do, and it was actually good that he was wiping off the bad people from the face of the earth. So Hitler, good. Pol Pot thought the Khmer Rouge was the best thing ever and should wipe out most of the people of Cambodia that didn't agree with him. Pol Pot, good. Stalin. He thought just murdering anybody who disagreed with him was a good thing. He did lots of things to, that seem horrendous to the world, but if it's relative and he thought he was doing good, then he's good. Well, then it breaks down for them. Well, no, 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 no. We, we, there, those clearly bad things and good things. Well, who gets to say that? Can I tell you about the Lord and his word? Again, always going back to his word. It's not hard to reconcile God and bad things happening. Habakkuk is sitting there questioning what's going on. He doesn't question if there's God. Remember, he says, aren't you from everlasting? Can't you get rid of this? He's not questioning the existence or goodness of God. He just can't reconcile why God isn't, again, smiting these people. But again, if he starts smiting people, where does that smiting end? Because we're all in that boat. We're all unrighteous on our own. And for people who wrestle against God and their struggles stems from a seeming injustices of God. They say, God's done unjust things, so therefore he can't be good. But here's what it is. If God is good, how can this happen? The question's wrong. The problem is not a problem of evil. It's a problem of sin. Sin is evil. So it's not evil things happen, therefore there's no God. It's there's a problem of sin, therefore God has to rightly and justly act on that sin. It's a sin issue. But that puts the issue not on God but us, and that becomes a problem for the world. Well, I'm not wrong. I can't be wrong. It can't be my fault that these things are happening. Therefore, it's got to be somebody greater's fault. And so the issue is that there's no reconciliation with the idea that our sin has caused the evil in this world. The problem for all issues is sin. What's funny this week is that um, I have, I, I've told you before, but I have some dumb dogs. Uh, and they do things all the time that you're like, I just, you just got put in your kennel or whipped or outside or whatever else. Like, you just had this happen to you. You keep going back to the same stupid thing and doing a stupid thing. Like I'm having this conversation with a dog in an empty house. I know, it's dumb, um, but it made me feel better. And all of a sudden, God used that conversation with the dog to hit me with something of my own. Like, you keep going back to the same sins. You keep eating that rhetorical uh, pile of puke that you keep going back to. The problem of evil for the lost is the problem of unrecognized sin and the consequences of sin. It's not a problem of evil in the world, therefore takes out God. It's a problem that we don't want to recognize that it is sin. That's why when we come to the recognition, those of us who are believers, we came to an understanding that I'm a sinner standing in front of a holy God. And that God one day is going to bring judgment on my unrighteousness and so therefore, I need something that can reconcile me back to God and save me from this sin that separates me from him. And then Christ is the answer to that. 
God doesn't commit evil, but he allows evil. He uses evil. He uses evil to keep his plan going forward. He will allow the things that take place and use them. Even Adam and Eve to sin in the garden was allowed so that the plan could continue that he had from all eternity and all time. And so we today live in a world marked by that curse. So there is evil. So a question asked not only by the lost, but by all when we face trials is why? That's what Habakkuk is asking. He's facing trials. That's what Job is asking. That's what a number of other people, Jeremiah is asking, why? How long, O Lord? That's why the psalmists are continuously writing, how long, O Lord? And I've actually been convicted in this question for myself. So I'm speaking for myself here. That when I ask that question, I've been asking that question about something a lot lot lately in my own life. Why, 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 why? And God has been convicting me with, why not? Why not? Not the answer I was hoping for, kind of like Habakkuk. (laughs) It's like, can you do something about these unjust people in Judah? Yeah, I'm going to send the Chaldeans, those really bad people. They're going to slaughter a bunch and then drive a whole bunch of people off and take them into captivity. That's my plan. The answer I've been praying for as I asked God why in this situation was not, why not? Why not I, a holy God, who has all things in my hands, who knows everything outside of time, in time, and everything for all eternity, and have made my plans and have made the course that it will be on, and not just all things eternally, but in my own life even specifically, why not should a sinner suffer in front of a holy God? Maybe that's not the thing you came here for this morning. Again, that's not the answer I was hoping for from God. But how can I complain when I have not even experienced the suffering a sinner should? When we talk about the fact that there's a lot of pain and sorrow and evil in the world, it is not to the extent that it could be, and neither is my punishment, neither is my suffering, neither is my pain in this world, no matter what I experience. It's never as bad as it could have been. We never experience pain and suffering that we deserve to the fullest extent. And that's hard words. I watched my grandpa go through cancer, a a guy who was a missionary for years, a guy who loved people well, a guy who led a lot of people to Christ. I mean, if we're going to talk about people who should have been treated well to the end, it should have been him. But he dies of cancer, and I watch him waste away. I watched this man who had served God on the mission field, and I've told you about this before, but I had to really wrestle through this for many years years. I mean, this has been 18 years ago, and I'm still sometimes just going, why him? But I guarantee you, knowing him as I do, he would have said, why not for his glory? You know how many people that guy got to share the gospel with in the hospital? You know how many nurses walked into their home while he was on hospice that heard about Christ Here's a guy dying, and he's telling them about Jesus and the joy of what he's about to experience. And a person who lives in the only the time that they believe that they have in front of them and don't even think about that beyond, that had to be so crazy to hear. God has allowed many terrible things to happen and has used many horrible things for his purposes. Evil men and women always think that they control God, but never understand their evil can and will be used by him for his purposes to be done and ultimately for his glory. God has stopped far more things than we could ever know. We think, why don't you stop X? But there have been so many things that God has stopped that we have never seen. We will never know. We will never comprehend. But God has stopped those things from taking place. We have seen God's hand in so many crazy ways that you should see this happen because this incident and somehow nobody saw any calamity from it. Somehow. The hand of God is for everyone. God works out his plans for all people. I even think about the end of a tornado. How did nobody die? God. And throughout history or in our own lives, the level of evil we experience or bad things that happen is not in proportion to our sin or in proportion to the good things that we do. He doesn't, again, dole out things based on stuff that we've done or haven't done. 
I mean, the question was asked of Jesus. Who sinned so that this man is blind? What was Jesus' response? Well, he did a lot of bad stuff, but his parents, they were terrible. Nobody. This man is blind so that God's glory can be shown. God allows or stops things for his purposes and his glory alone. That's hard to wrestle with. I get it. But the thing is, is I rest more back in him. The more I rest back in his word and the truth that I find in it and the peace that I know that is there, the more I seem to understand and wrestle with or understand and stop wrestling with the things I don't get. When evil or bad things comes for the believer, we should respond completely different than the world does. The world gets angry. The world throws a fit. The world goes crazy. The world blames God or denies God because all these things are happening. When the person gets elected that you don't like, well, darn it, where were you, Lord? If this happens over here, where were you at on that one? But I always go back to one of my favorite people when it comes to this kind of stuff, and that's Horatio Spafford, who wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul. A guy who lost almost everything in the Chicago fire and then is trying to send his family, his, his four daughters and his wife, back on a ship. And the ship actually sinks on its way back across the ocean. And as it's sinking, the only person to survive is his wife, and all of his daughters die. He's sailing back across to go be with his wife after this tragedy happens. And as he is crossing over the ocean, exactly where they believe that the boat went down, he is thinking and writing the song, It Is Well With My Soul. When sea billows roll, you have taught me to say. It doesn't happen by accident for the believer. You don't respond to bad things in a godly manner by accident because you happen to come to church sometimes. You do it because you rest in him, because you have learned to wait on him, because you have learned to trust even in the horrible things, him who has an ultimate plan beyond what we could possibly imagine. Again, it is well with my soul, not my situation. And I'm going to wait on the one who holds it all anyway. It's good to ask why. It's good to ask why. It's, that's not a bad thing. We see it 11 times in this. 11 Psalms are dedicated to asking God why. There's multiple other people in the Bible who ask God why. But I was interested this week as I was reading Paul Little. He says this, God's will for us is not a package lowered for us on a string but a scroll that unrolls from day to day, so we wait on the Lord. That was so helpful for me. I mean, we kind of expect his will and his gifts and his heart and his plan to just kind of come to us as a gift instead of waiting to see as it unrolls as a scroll before us the things that he has planned. I'm not trying to diminish the bad things that have happened in your life or my life. I'm not trying to diminish those things. And God doesn't diminish those things either. He is near to us. He cares for us. The Bible over and over again tells us about a God who is almighty in all things, yet comes near to the brokenhearted. That's a relationship with the Lord that we can never fathom, even the depths of what that looks like from his side. We see it from ours, but we could never understand from his side. And I'll tell you, I'm with you. It seems like evil wins far more than it should. That men and women that are the worst. Remember that list we talked about, that we have this list that we've compiled? It seems like a lot of those people escape judgment. It seems like nothing's going to happen to them. Why don't they get what they deserve? That's Habakkuk's complaint. Can't you just take this king and the knuckleheads who go with him and just get rid of them? The Chaldeans are coming. The Babylonians are going to sweep you away. Can't you just do something about the Babylonians then? And the thing is, is that it was probably right for him to ask that because he could not see what God had planned. But then God responds. And God says, whoa. Not like, whoa but a heavy answer, and that's point two. Woe to him. God gives a five-fold response here from verses 6 through verses 19 that are heavy. 
I mean, we struggle with waiting on God doing something about the wicked. We all wait for that judgment of the wicked. In fact, I think if there are certain people who would face judgment on earth, we would get a little bit more excited than if we saw somebody else get judgment on earth. Play that out however you want to. I don't really care. I'm just saying that that's the case for all of us. And we would love to see that judgment happen. We would like to know that there's justice that will take place. But as William Booth said, God is not in a hurry, but I sure am. Asking how long, again, is not necessarily a bad thing. We see in Romans 8 that that Paul's talking about here. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondages to corruption and to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. The whole world knows that it's evil that is going on. And the whole world is waiting for God to reconcile these things back. The whole world has been saying from the beginning of time has been eagerly anticipating this. And the graphic image here is amazing. I don't know how you ladies do it. I could see maybe you have one kid. But after watching the pain that you go through, y'all going to come back for two? But God so graciously, as I watched my wife go through the pain of her first childbirth, and then I watch her hold that baby and glow, a radiant glow, holding that child the labor pains, what they produced, and the joy that comes through that. The imagery that Paul is using here is phenomenal, that there's so much pain taking place. And we long to see God deal with the wickedness or come, Lord Jesus, come. But the Lord is not late or hurried. The people of Judah are going to face the Chaldeans and will face God's judgment and punishment as well. I mean, did you notice What it said in chapter 1, it said, I am raising up the Chaldeans. He is purposely going to raise them up to a position where they can rain down the justice that he is going to rain down on the people of Judah. And however, the Chaldeans or the Babylonians will not miss out on their punishment as he starts to lay out the woe. All the things that he said, these are the people that do this stuff in chapter 1. Now he says that stuff will be their woe. He calls them out. He tells them that the punishment is coming. The reasons why the Babylon deserve its punishment are laid out right here. So Habakkuk wonders why. Are you going to really let this unjust people harm the righteous? Isn't that our call today? God, aren't you really going to call out the unrighteous and deal with the unrighteous in our day? And all the things that God calls out through verses 6 through 19 are, woe to you because you've done these things and it's coming back to you. It will happen to you as well. And their woe has a purpose, though. I read the scriptures to you uh, for a purpose. I do a lot of highlighting and circling and starring and things in my Bible. But it's interesting, in the middle of the woes, We get to verse 14 where it says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The Lord's glory will fill the earth, not anyone or anything else. The Chaldeans might be like the the locusts swarming through, but they will never fill the earth. The Lord's glory will fill the earth. We talked a little bit last week about wanting to see woe. But I told you and I was challenged to think of eternity in mind instead of getting even or seeing someone get what they deserve. As I said before, as believers, we will never see the punishment we deserve. We always want to see the injustice of somebody else. We have done so much ourselves in our sin and our trespasses against a holy God that we deserve it as well. And we deserve death and pain and separation from God eternally. This woe before you became a believer was on your head. This woe, if you're not a believer in the room, is still on your head. You may not be the Babylonians, but the woe against those who are 
standing against God and his eternal salvation, that woe is on you. The thing is, is that we deserve all that, but God, I can say it is well with my soul. And what about those who do not believe? Those who do evil or even the good who do not believe, I already said it's the woe. While the righteous will face judgment and correction for our sanctification, Judah, Israel, is facing judgment and they are facing punishment to be drawn back to the Lord for the sanctification of its people, the nation of Israel. I'm using that word in light of what we're talking about here. To draw them back to the Lord so that he can reestablish them again. But the righteous in our day, you and I personally will face judgment. We will face correction. We will face those things, but for our sanctification and ultimately for our salvation. The wicked will face judgment ultimately for their destruction. Not in the temporary, but in the the eternal. If we have a biblical picture of hell, eternity and suffering in that eternity, we would wish that no one would perish. As the scriptures tell us that God feels that way as well. But we know and have a right picture of the scriptures. We would wish hell on nobody. I've said it before, but if you could experience five seconds of hell, you would have the perspective to share the gospel with every breath you have. No one, no one, should end in hell if we have the opportunity to share the gospel with them. We should never hate anyone that much for anything that's ever happened to wish them a hell for eternity. The woe we see here is not a stern word, but a condemnation of judgment. For some in the now, Same thing here. We'll see some face that condemnation here on the earth and they'll face judgment here on the earth. And even if they spend the rest of their life in jail, that is not anything compared to the eternity that awaits an unbeliever. So the last point is verse, is my third point, which is hope. Because the gospel that Habakkuk could never understood or comprehend. There's no way Habakkuk could have understood the gospel. When God says, I'm working something out, he's working it out for the day that is taking place there, but he's also working it out for the days to come. You may understand this, Israel, that I'm taking you away, I'm bringing you back, and I'm going to do all these other things, but everything is happening for the purpose from all eternity to now and all the way through that I'm going to bring about the salvation of people. There's good news. The gospel is called good news because there is bad news. The gospel is called good news because there's a problem of sin, yet God has provided a way to answer that problem of sin. And while it seems like things are rough, there is hope for the believer. I mean, it seemed like the Babylonians had the final say. And while in Judah and in Israel, they kind of did have the final say, or so it looked like at that time, it will never be the case for eternity. For the righteous who live by faith... God will ultimately have the final say. And actually, those who don't live by faith, God will ultimately have the final say. And for the Israelites, they were waiting for God's answer. They're waiting for the Messiah. Habakkuk says, I will stand on the wall on top of the tower to look for your answer. I will look for the answer that you're going to give. And even through the answer that it gets, yeah, it looks like people are going to get what they're supposed to somewhere down the line. I'll never see it, but it'll happen to somebody somewhere sometime. But even on that watchtower through the answer that God gives, he'll never be able to fully recognize the awesomeness of what will take place for you and I in Christ. So they're looking, they're looking for the Messiah. They're looking forward to the Messiah. They want to see the Messiah. And Habakkuk is waiting and looking for relief, but instead will never see that full promise revealed. It will be through the righteousness of following God through the law, the righteousness of following God through sacrifices, the righteousness of following all the things that God has commanded them. And yet in the end, God will then, uh, they will receive heaven because of those things that they were doing. But for us, we don't have to perform ceremonies. We don't have to make sacrifices. I don't have to long 
for salvation to come at some point in the future because it has come in the person of Christ. Habakkuk and all those before Christ could have never fully understood what God will do. And instead of following a law that only showed that we could never live up, that's what the law was. The law was never meant to actually fully save them. The law was meant to go, you can't keep it. You can't do it. But there will be one in whom you can find salvation. And instead of making sacrifices for our sins, and instead of hoping God would do something, we see what God has done. We see that God has provided a Savior and a way. We're going to live in a time after, when we live in a time after Christ, we are offered salvation as a gift from a Savior who paid a penalty that we could never pay. I could never be good enough. I could never be righteous enough in my own strength. I can't do enough religious things. So if you're clinging to those things, I pray, I read the Bible, I do this, but there's never been a moment where you came to the point where you said, my sin is going to cause me eternal separation from God. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Lord, save me. You can be as religious as you want. There's going to be so many people, and this breaks my heart, who will stand before the Lord, having done all kinds of religious things for their entire life, and they will say, I never knew you away from me. So knowing Christ is bigger than some actions. Now, knowing Christ produces actions within us, but our good deeds and our religious deeds and our religious actions don't save. It is only through the blood of Christ so that no one can boast, as Ephesians 2 says. And God's a righteous judge. He is loving. He is merciful. He is full of grace. He is all of those things all of the time, 100%. But his righteousness and our sin can't be forgotten. The righteousness of God is perfect. The righteousness and standard that the Lord has set before people is perfection. The Lord cannot be in sin. And if the Lord can't be in sin and I have nothing to cover my sin or nothing to take away that sin and I stand with my pile of sin before a holy and righteous God, there's nothing he can do but cast me away. But those of us who are found in Christ, we are covered. Our sins are paid for. Not one sin that we have committed or will commit is not paid for by Christ. It is paid for fully. The check has been cleared. It is paid. And only those who stand before the Lord covered by the blood of Christ can be saved. Habakkuk could never have understood God's plan. This is something that just blows me away as I think about this as well. Because I'm thinking about the people that God has placed in our lives. I'm thinking about the people who I feel are overbearing. I feel about uh, the people who I uh, have strife and struggle with. Or I think about the people who are around us in the neighborhoods. I mean, Habakkuk could have never fully understood that these people who destroyed and took advantage of and hated God and hated his people and drug them away, that Jesus Christ would die on a cross for their descendants the same way that he would die on the cross for the descendants of Israel. I'm going to do something that you could never imagine. How about the fact that my son's blood will save those who have persecuted you? The descendants of those who have persecuted you have the same opportunity for salvation through my son's blood. God's plan is always bigger and greater. Yes, there's a problem of evil. It's sin. Yes, there is woe for those who do not follow the Lord but there's a plan that is bigger and greater than we possibly could have imagined. So my question is, what about you today? Where do you put your faith in eternity? In your hands, in your religious deeds, or do you know Christ as your Savior? Does that woe hang over your head? And I'm not going to sugarcoat this stuff. We don't sugarcoat the Bible because God's very clear. If you don't know him, that woe hangs over. I can't say anything that's going to save you. The Lord can speak through his word. The spirit can move mightily. The Lord may be working on you right now. But there's no righteous deeds. There's no acts. There's nothing else that can save you but the blood of Christ. And when we come to a realization that our sin is dark, our sin is ultimately crushing, our sin is ultimately damning for eternity, then we turn towards the Lord and we say, save me. The prayer of a broken, dependent person to a divine and righteous redeemer is powerful. It's not the prayer, but confessing our sin, repenting and turning away from our sin, and believing that Jesus is our only Savior will save. 
I'm going to finish with this. Didn't plan to, but the song this morning. It was finished upon that cross. He rose that we would be free indeed. Are you free in Christ Jesus today? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I do thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray, God, that, that as we hear your word, we would respond to it. Lord, I pray that we would not be caught up in the mire of things, but God, I just pray that people's hearts would be open. I pray as we come into church, we don't walk into church with some preconceived notion. We don't walk into church just kind of as part of what we do. It's hard to read things like Habakkuk, Lord. It honestly is. But ultimately, God, it's for our good and for your glory and for us to consider these things. It's for our good and, our, and your glory to consider the issues of evil. And ultimately, the evil in this world is caused by sin. God, I pray that everyone in this room, if they have not, will consider what their sin is. And if they are a believer, I pray, God, that we would uh, see this still. Uh, those things in our lives that we still wrestle with need to be put to death, not played with as a toy. I pray that we would understand where we stand before you, Lord. And God, I pray that you would work heavy on the hearts of those who don't believe. God, it's okay for us to ask why. I know that, Lord. I know that a lot of these people in this room have faced horrific things in their life that they have screamed out why. Lord, I pray that they would find peace in you, that they would stand resolute in you, that they would find their hope in you, and Lord, that they would seek answers for eternity, not just for the here and now. Lord, it's your work to do, and we trust you in it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. The uh, scripture that Ron read earlier, Psalm 27, uh, we're going to sing now. Uh, the Lord is my light and my salvation. In whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? He is trustworthy. Won't you stand with us as we uh... Oh, <laughs> 
house of the Lord all my days. week. Uh, one of the things in Habakkuk 2 is he says, I will stand on the tower and see what your response will be, and then my response to your response. And a lot of people say that he did this in a defiant way, but I think that he put himself on the watchtower, or you know, in a, in a way, in words, that he set himself on the watchtower so that he can get a wider view from God what is actually going to take place. And the reason I think that is because of what his response is in chapter 3. And that's what the amazing beauty of, even if we're faced with the hardest of the hardest responses from the Lord, if we truly have a bigger picture of what God is doing, our response will mirror his in chapter 3. So as you read this week, think through those things. But now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the, one, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday.